welcome everybody to um, the regular NHSR webinar series that we have and I'm, I'm, I'm lost for words because I'm really excited for today's session which is um, introduction to Quarto for our users from Filippo. We had a bit of a technical issue at the last time we tried to do this so welcome to everybody who tried to come back again and those who are new today. I'm not going to talk very much because this is just far too exciting. What I will say is that we don't have the chat open in this particular view that we have but we do take uh, questions and answers which I'll be keeping an eye on throughout and what I'll do is uh, give Filippo the chance to do his talk and then I will uh, curate those questions at the very end or I'll try and reply to them to you in the meantime but without further ado I'll hand over to Filippo. Thank you very much Zoe, thank you very much Kelly. thanks for the invitation it's a pleasure to be here and present uh, the NHSR, NHSR community is an exciting community and uh, everybody that uh, supports Sarah for me is a, is a huge friend. <laughs> um, so my name is Filippo Cavallari and today I'm going to introduce you to speak to you about an introduction to Quarto for our users. Just uh, um, a little bit of background about myself. I am currently a lecturer in data science at the um, Office for National Statistics and worked previously for some years in academia teaching mathematics and data science. And I started using R, I just realized that it's more than 10 years, so I'm definitely getting old. Um, as I mentioned to you, what I want to talk to you uh, about today is an introduction to Quarto. And uh, I want to tell you where uh, this thing started for me. And it's from a blog post from one of our bloggers that I usually follow, which is Alison Hill. I don't know if you're familiar with this blog post, but basically at some point, uh, I didn't know anything about Quarto. And in April, I just read this one. And uh, she was talking about this new, from her website, I'm citing, I'm quoting, uh, this new tool for reporting and what is Quarto and what you can do with Quarto. There are some details and this, this is a brief introduction. It's still a useful one. Uh, by the way, if you want to access to my slides, uh, uh, they are uh, on this website, so you can just go here and you will find all the links. Can I share this link in the chat? Uh, is that possible? People will see Not it. Not in the chat, but what we will do is put it on the YouTube video that we upload after the event and also okay. um, try and share it on the website. Yeah, so basically uh, you will find all the links to all these things together. And also actually you can navigate this page if you want, for example. Anyway, Going back to this, so going back to this blog post, after reading this blog post, what I um, have seen after playing a little bit around, I didn't have much time uh, on that spring playing with Quarta, I was working on many other things. But then after very small experiments, I'd seen that there was a formal introduction to Quarta done in the RStudio conference. So we are going on uh, we are going to be in July now, basically, and there is a video about that uh, presentation done by uh, Milly Minne Sentigaya Rondell and Julia Stewart. And they start talking about, uh, in a beautiful presentation, about things that you can do in Quarto and uh, all the excitement about it. And what I think that one thing that I found is that basically uh, Quarto does similar things, uh, exactly the same things that you can do in tools that you're probably familiar with. So if you are an user, uh, definitely you will know the list of, uh, of tools that I'm going to mention to you shortly. And uh, the, the approach is to simplify basically our life. So if you go on the website of Quarto, and again, this is the website, you will see that there is a, a brief description about uh, what is Quarto. And basically it's a publishing system. With Quarto, you can publish stuff, especially stuff that is produced using uh, languages that are usually like associated with data science. And so you will see a list of languages that are like Python, R and Julia, and also I learned going to on the work website about Observable, which is still a, a tool that I need to, to try and test. OK, but let's do a step back and let's speak about uh, uh, what should be like your usual experience if you are an R user. So if you're a user like me and uh, you have got some years of experience in R, then definitely one of the reasons why you should have learned R is because of one of these tools. So uh, the capability of R is not just to provide a statistical language, a language for statistical analysis that is like easy to 
uh, easy to use and really effective very quick. So you don't have to have like a deep programming language, a deep computer science knowledge. But one of the, um, the good things about R is providing tools for doing this statistical analysis in a very quick way. The problem at at some point was that after having this tool, uh, what we want to do is just to report uh, this uh, uh, kind of discoveries that we do through our statistical analysis. And then uh, basically what happens is that to report these things, we may need to create a document that can be in different formats, depending on our audience or the team we work with, or sometimes we want just to, to recap all the things that we have found in uh, a bigger document, say a book, or you want to create a blog post. Uh, this can be an interesting other way of reporting things of, uh, about your discoveries, especially, for example, if you're writing tutorials or new discoveries. Uh, um, you may want to just to create uh, a web page or web content, or even uh, another option is uh, like what I'm doing right now is to create a presentation. And then our markdown, and then book down, and block down, and page down, and distill, and xarigan, all these packages that were like, uh, that are still in my art, even if I'm not using <laughs> basically all of them anymore since I are more or less, uh, basically did this job. There were specialized packages that were capable of dealing with all these problems. And one thing uh, that basically was in common in all of them, more or less, so without being too technical, was to convert a markdown document, which basically is a document that melts the markdown syntax together with code chunks that are usually specialized dark code chunks. There were possibilities of including other languages. For example, in Python, um, one option uh, was to use uh, reticulate in order to include Python code. Uh, and basically you can transform any input of this kind in a document that can have one of the formats that I mentioned. So basically it was possible in a reproducible and quick way to uh, create documents uh, that were coming from your statistical analysis without uh, and basically uh, having the necessity of doing copying and paste. So uh, after you create your wonderful plot in ggplot, after you create your wonderful uh, um, table of summary of uh, some data, then you can avoid copying and pasting this in your LaTeX document or in your Word document or in your PowerPoint presentation. But you can just like um, transform everything um, um, in a reproducible and automated way. Plus, of course, there was also uh, a way of parameterizing this document. So if you are an user that was using one of these tools, uh, for example, if you want to create uh, an um, automated reporting system that is dependent on one or more parameters that are within your data, this was possible and it was absolutely reproducible, automated, splendid. There were some limitations in this. The main limitation using these six packages, possibly used even more, these are the ones that I use the most, uh, was that sometimes uh, there was no consistency. So sometimes there were some kind of syntax differences and uh, um, basically you needed to remember uh, the peculiarities of one of each uh, of these packages. So that's why once upon a time I had this like uh, this private uh, uh, set of notes uh, that reminded me like a template that I had a boilerplate for each of these kind of documents that I was producing. Second problem that I mentioned was that even if it po was possible, for example, to include also Python code, for example, using reticulate uh, markdown packages, let me call it in this way, were not capable to natively support uh, uh, other languages, especially uh, the other languages used in uh, data science. And uh, uh, what Quarto does is basically to support more languages. So as I mentioned to you, R of course is supported. Quarto after all is done by Posit. This is the new name of our studios in it. And uh, uh, Python is supported, so you can create a markdown document that be can be converted into a report or a, let's say any other output that you want natively, so you don't have to pass through the reticulate package and host everything within a script. You can also use Julia. I didn't test this at all. Even if I have got a limited uses of Julia, I didn't test at all Quarto, but I've been told that it works well also with Julia and also with Observable, which again is something that I need to test. So basically the idea is to make uh, a tool that is universal, is independent from the package, so you can create any output 
and using any language. And another thing that Corta does is to support many more uh, uh, IDEs. Now, when I use R, I always use uh, R Studio, and I don't see why not. Depending on your needs, uh, you may want to use other ones. Uh, sometimes I happen to use the Visual Studio Code. I'm not a big fan of Jupyter, and uh, uh, everybody is telling me that I need to start using NeoVim, even if uh, uh, I still haven't. Uh, because if you want to be like a, a really a pro, then uh, that's the tool that you have to go for. Anyway, um, whatever is your um, favorite ID and whatever you want to experiment, the port integrates perfectly with all of these tools. Of course, if you are in our studio, what you will have is uh, classic uh, uh, interfaces like uh, um, buttons for uh, rendering your document and knitting them uh, in some sense. In uh, the other IDEs, uh, there are some extensions, but the key, uh, the key part, the key, the core idea behind the Quarto is the fact that Quarto is a, a tool that is completely independent, so it's not anymore a package. And in fact, the Quarto is a command line interface. So basically, the idea that they had was to transform whatever was your um, your input using a program that runs through the command line. So basically, uh, if you are a GitHub user, for example, usually you will go to on the command line and do things like git, uh, add, push, uh, and commit. Then basically you're doing the similar things in the command line. So to have an, um, um, a universal approach, this is my suggestion. Again, there are ways of, for example, within our studio doing these things uh, automatically, but then if you want to, for example, apply uh, the use of court to pipelines that are outside that context, uh, the command line is definitely my way to go. You don't have to be dependent on, on the, on the idea, idea at all. Okay. Um, now, what are the kind of formats that you can use? Well, in, the terms, in terms of formats, the things that you can um, output are the usual ones that we know. Uh, there are some more, for example, Word documents, uh, PDFs, HTMLs, and also OpenOffice in terms of documents. You can output presentations. In this case, the big new entry is Reveal.js presentations, but also PowerPoint to Beamer, if you fancy them. You can create websites, so you can create uh, blogs and books very easily, and uh, of course, much more. The approach is, again, as I told you, a unified approach, which is the big, big thing, and the approach is the for the following. So you take on the command line uh, your document, for example, a Q and d which is the new format introduced by uh, Quarto for the um, uh, our users, which is the Quarto Markdown format. And basically you create, uh, you call a Quarto, then you render, and then you specify the document in the following path. So with this approach, you can do any language, any format, always with the same syntax. So that's the main, the main big thing. Uh, now, if you are experienced with R Markdown, then things like this can be sound familiar to you. So, uh, what you have to do at the top of your script, at the top of your document, your Markdown document, you have to include a YAML header. And this is where all the magic happens, uh, because what you are going to do is to specify a title, as we did for the Markdown. Formats are uh, have got slightly different names now. So we have got HTML format or PDF format or docx, for example, for uh, um, documents. And uh, uh, through this kind of syntax, basically, we are it is possible to us to achieve um, all the results that we are uh, that we want. Again, the key idea here is uh, uh, that the approach is unified. Some people, for example, I had discussions with many people about this, uh, and they think that Quarto is some kind of rebranding of our Markdown, and actually there is some changes in the syntax. Um, however, what I do think is that actually the, the key, the, the, the main thing, the main bit here is um, uh, um, is the fact that the, 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 the syntax is unified and you don't have any more to uh, have the specialized knowledge of a specific package for a specific output. Um, what happens next? So after the three dashes at the end of your YAML header, then everything that happens is something that we already know. So you insert your uh, text as usual, so plain text, for example, uh, 
Palmer Penguins is a classic, isn't it? So some text about, that you want to insert in your analysis, and then you can insert your chunk of code. So as usual, the three back ticks uh, in curly brackets, the languages that you want to use, and then, uh, for example, this is something that you can do um, uh, for analyzing the Penguins dataset in R. Okay. Having said this, so this is the, the main bit, what changes in terms of formatting? Well, all the usual things, all the usual bits that we already know about formatting are still there. So there's nothing new that we need to know in terms of formatting most of the, most of the times. Um, the usual way of changing italics and bold, superscripts, subscripts, everything about the um, the formatted that we already know are still there and there's nothing that we really need to change. Headers as well, there are six levels of headers and uh, there's nothing much more to say about this. So I don't want to include any more in terms of the markdown. Uh, of course, the things that you can do are also uh, created lists, created table, created equations. There is a complete reference about all the basics that you need to know about Markdown. If you go on the website of Quarto, there is a full reference of everything, that, every bit that you need to know about, uh, including any kind of object. So you can include lists, tables, source code, you can include equations, diagrams, uh, and so on. Everything that you want is there. And on the usual syntax is more or less the same. Again, as I mentioned, one thing that is useful for especially for my job is um, the use of equations. So uh, as part of my teaching, I sometimes show some people some formulas, which of course is super scary for them. And sometimes they will see things like this that are produced by using um, very normal LaTeX syntax. So there's nothing special in this, and if you use, uh, if you are a user of LaTeX, then uh, just include, uh, you can include the inline equations or display equations, depending if you're including one dollar or two dollars, and uh, these equations appear as normal. Okay, a new a novelty for me is that actually we can also include diagrams. Oh, this is much smaller than I planned to be. Okay, anyway. Uh, there is this language mermaid that actually was a news for me. And so if, for example, you want to include diagrams, again, you don't, you don't have to call any new package, for example, for including P diagrams. And uh, you have got like a native support to this uh, mermaid language for inserting flowcharts or uh, more complicated diagrams. It's not that difficult. Another thing, another thing that is really nice for me and nice to have, and usually uh, used to bother me a lot, are uh, callout blocks. So uh, once upon a time when I was using uh, one of the packages that I mentioned at the beginning, I need to customize my callout blocks or create them. So I'm creating some kind of customized ones. And I used to have some, um, some, uh, how can I say, some kind of template for them. Now they are natively supported. You will have callout blocks of this kind. You can change them. They can make be, uh, they can be foldable, collapsible, or not. They have you have got uh, four or five different types, and uh, I think that is useful. Is that the syntax is very simple. So you will call uh, you include a callout block in your markdown code by using uh, the three columns. The in in curly brackets, you have to include the the kind of callout block that you want to include, and then the the content. Nothing more than this. The other big novelty, and this is something that actually I think is a big game changer compared to a markdown, is that the uh, code chunks options are not anymore specified in within the curly brackets when we call the language. So that part is now reserved to um, to the language, and we were used to include all the options here. So. Sometimes I've had very long like uh, strings, including all the options of my chunk. The novelty here is that you can include these options uh, at the beginning of your code chunk by starting with uh, an hashtag and uh, a pipe. There are many options. There is a full reference of this uh, in the Quarto website, and uh, I warmly suggest you to go there. This actually was, uh, this is something that of course makes our code much more readable and uh, is definitely a difference that you have to keep in mind if you are uh, uh, um, an R Markdown user moving, trying to move into Quarto. Another thing that actually didn't change at all was the use of uh, graphics. So 
uh, if you want to include, for example, a ggplot, uh, uh, the standard is always the same. So what you have to include is uh, uh, you may not, uh, you may want or may not want to include your code for uh, your graphics, and then the output is produced as usual. Of course, there are options for controlling the size of your plot, uh, the position, everything as usual is, is stated there. Please remember that the, the key thing here is that um, the part that we want to, um, the, 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 the comments that we want to use to uh, change the disposition or size of our, uh, of our graph or our plot are chunk options that we need to include after the, the starting, uh, after the beginning of the chunk. Uh, Another example, I think these are things that I did, for example, for uh, other presentations um, is, for example, is that you can split things in tab sets. Keep in mind that the things that I'm doing here for you uh, are the same things that you can do in HTML documents. So the current document that you are observing is a Reveal.js presentation, uh, which of course is uh, uh, very nice, and but the tab sets and all the other elements can be HTML elements. Some of these elements, of course, uh, cannot be included, for example, in PDFs. Uh, so examples of things that you can do is, for example, to split your code, your graph, and this is the syntax that kind of produce it. Remember that each tab set is specified using a uh, header level. Okay. One of the things that I showed in one of the NHS activities that I'm doing, this was the, from the introduction to uh, machine learning courts, is uh, things like this. So a very nice example that somebody really, uh, people really enjoyed during that presentation was uh, like showing uh, some people some set of points that we want to model in a certain way and to distinguish like different um, different options for uh, um, possible choices of the model. So uh, one thing that I found really useful was to include uh, um, different choices for the regression line for these points, and then finally show them the best. Okay. Uh, another thing that I re was recently involved was the presentation of uh, um, uh, a course about understanding uh, um, the uh, optimization process in um, in using gradient descent in order to find uh, the coefficients of a logistic regression. So I presented that part in um, I presented that part in uh, sorry reports that I delivered at ONS. And the thing that I did basically there was to provide them interactive slides where they, was, they were able to see uh, using a, uh, some automated functions that I've done in Porto. This is not working. Why not? My slides are not working anyway. This was supposed to, okay, now it's working. Um, basically I was showing them, let's go back here. I should, sorry, these slides are not working, wonderful. Let me reload the page maybe. Okay, anyway, these are some slides that are coming from activities that I did for this course about machine learning where I was showing uh, different stages of the optimization stage of for finding a logistic regression. Okay. Um, other things that I did for um, uh, in my work with Court in the last year were mainly about presentations. Of course, as a lecturer, I deliver a lot of presentations, especially having um, educative content uh, related to data science. And uh, uh, the magic happens where basically the only thing that we need to change is in our um, in our format and we need to include the reveal JS as a format. So um, one thing that is really useful compared to other tools is that now we have got uh, a nicer like setup of, of the information. So, so something that I really enjoyed it. And uh, for example, we have got the navigation menu, which includes the list of our slides, uh, some tools. Uh, one thing that I'm using, for example, right now is the presentation pane that is here. 
with the speaker view, plus we can have, of course, the slider view and uh, um, other modalities. Um, one thing that you can do that you have to remember is a functionality that, for example, can allow you to zoom on the slides. You can include slides number very quickly, uh, changing the settings in your uh, YAML format, which is at the beginning. You can preview links. So one thing is that basically this website can be a container for other websites. And so if you set up this option in your um, in your syntax or in the quarter presentation, then you can preview, for example, the NHSR community website. And uh, for those who are more paying more attention, you have noticed that I've got these two bots in here, uh, which are like uh, a preview, uh, well, uh, an easy access to the chalkboard. So for example, if you want to write some notes with your chalkboard, this is something that is possible and you can disable it, or you may want to take notes. So for example, if like me, you are teaching or delivering some kind of presentation and you've got a tablet where you can write on top of it, this is a, a nice to have. Okay, and what else? Uh, things that you have to keep in mind is that again, the, all the magic happens in the, uh, in the YAML header. And these are two things that are really, really useful for me. So first one is that if you are um, executing some chunks of code that requires a long computation, it may be useful to remember that you need to cache your results or refresh them depending on what stage you are. So this is one thing that if you are not an experienced user, you may want to explore. And the other one is that depending on your needs, the when the, depending on the way you want to publish your documents, you may want to uh, embed resources, which basically means that the HTML or Reveal.js document that you are producing is all self-contained. So rather than having subfolders containing all the extra material that is linked to that page, um, everything is just in one place in one file. Of course, this is going to uh, create files that are much bigger. And if you're including mathematics, uh, keep in mind that there's an extra option for uh, the mathematics engine used, which sometimes can be um, really heavy um, and not so easy uh, to, to, um, to share. So uh, you may want to decide to include that part of, or, or not. Now, the, um, another thing that is important for me, and actually this is motivating me to uh, creating a long list of things that I would like to do, is the easy creations of websites. So uh, in the past, uh, I mentioned some um, I mentioned some packages you link to R that were like uh, capable of creating websites of different kinds. So for example, you can create books uh, or you can create blogs and so on. Uh, I never test them, I have to confess, but I need to say that in terms of Quarto, creating a website uh, is super easy. So I did exactly this website that is linked to this page in, uh, I think it was less than five minutes in total, where it's easy to find uh, uh, different sections, so not something new. You just have got the preset menus and uh, preset, sorry, teams. And the one thing that you can do, I need to and, uh on the canvas, yes. And you can create um, websites that, for example, can be the summary of your projects or presentations of some of the materials that you're producing. So for example, I don't know, you can create a website that contains different pages quickly. Each of these document has to be uh, a Quarto Markdown document, for example, in this case. But of course, you can do this also in other languages. And um, the magic again happens in the YAML header, where you can specify very quickly the strategy, the structure of your website, including the reference to the documents that are generating each page, and for example, also the positioning in the structure of your document. Another nice thing is that apart from the teams, that there is some presets of teams, you can also customize them. Uh, so if you are a proficient CSS users, user, then things that you can do are definitely to customize your websites. I'm not great in this thing, so I need definitely to, to improve on this part. But um, if you have got experience in CSS, again, Quart integrates this styles uh, um, file where you basically can have the control of the appearance of your document or your website in the way that you prefer. 
Another important thing to mention is to the fact that again, uh, all the magic happens here. So for me, it was a game changer. I started using Quarto, uh, using the buttons in a studio now. Basically, if I have to interact with Quarto, I always interact with it using the command line, which generally my, is my good to go choice. And uh, becoming familiar with the syntax is something that I suggest you to do. To do. So apart from uh, different options, uh, which are self-explanatory. This is the help that you can get from the command line. So for example, you can specify the title of your project, the kind of project that you want to create, um, or if you are using a specific template. Again, another good thing is that, for example, you can create templates. You can use different engines. I usually use uh, Markdown, Itar. I don't code too much in Jupyter, so that's why I don't use it much. Um, the good thing is that at the end, in this com in these examples, you will find how to create the different projects depending on um, different uh, kind of project, different uh, um, engines, and also uh, other options like the environments that you want to use or the language that you want to use. So being proficient with this is going to give you full control on all your projects. So especially if you are um, like me working in a team, for example, at ONS, where we use different languages and also different environments, uh, utilizing this way, this, um, this project uh, is, is going to be like a really good thing and gives you like complete control. We don't, we're not experiencing any more uh, um, problems in terms of environment by using this kind of uh, strategies. Okay. What I'm currently doing, so basically in the last year, uh, the things that happened with Porto for me, um, we are running the graduate program at ONS, which is a program that we run in two years and where uh, we deliver uh, data science courses to a court of, at the moment, there are almost 170 new hires in the public sector. And uh, uh, basically, the program involves uh, uh, three days of training per month for a couple of years, uh, depending from the topic. So we start from introduction to R and Python up to uh, topics like mathematics for machine learning. Uh, we are currently reviewing all the materials. So when I came at ONS, uh, there was a lot of teaching material prepared also by different teams that were at the Dutton's campus and the task that we undertook was to basically revise all this material in terms of updating the content. First, because of change of the versions of R and Python, but also uh, we are currently working on uh, the uh, use of Quarto and all of this. So it's a work that my team is doing at the moment and uh, it's a bit long, I have to say. Uh, but it's really rewarding and also we can standardize uh, all the outputs uh, in a very nice way. So we are pretty satisfied about it. I uh, also created uh, some things that I inserted in the program as well. So uh, there is an introduction to machine learning and uh, a training in two days and understanding gradient descent where I stress a lot of people about all the mathematics behind the gradient descent and all the presentations and some of the materials that I presented to you was coming from there. At the moment, I am also delivering since now a couple of years. It all started with the pandemic with a workshop of one day that should have been in person, but then everything happened online very quickly because of the pandemic. And now it became uh, a couple of trainings uh, uh, that are fundamental of data science that is currently running. We just did the first session and uh, we just finished, I think it was in February, a fundamental summer machine learning training as well. On my to-do list, I really hope that Quart is going to provide me an excuse to start in my blog and report everything to everyone. This is kind of a thing that everyone in the sense world now is doing. I think it's a good thing, but I am too lazy to start, so I always say, yeah, I will start tomorrow. That's uh, my big problem with this. So let's see. Probably Quart will be the motivation for doing that. Things that I found useful. Well, first of all, I always referred since the beginning to the Quarto website. So this website, I'm going to open it a little bit just quickly, contains everything that you need to do. So starting from downloading Quarto. Actually, I think, Zoe, I was telling you this in the NHSR community Slack channel, 
that I found that there were updates of Quarto uh, that I didn't know for like six months. And so basically <laughs> now I'm stressed about the thing and I set up like a, a monthly alarm <laughs> to check if whether there or not there are new versions. And uh, of course, as is, uh, it's always inspirational to have a look at the Quarto galleries so or things that you can do. Um, this is a really nice like way to see what is achievable with Quarto. Nothing new I have to say, so it's not something that we would say, oh, this is something that we never did with other languages. But again, you, what you really have to do if you're not a Quarto user is to appreciate like the uniformity of the approach and the consistency of it. So for me, for example, it's much less difficult to remember or the peculiarities. Once upon a time when I was using all these other different packages it was much more difficult. Uh, I suggest you to have a look at uh, A Quarto Tip in a, de uh, a Day, which is this blog by uh, Mine Sentica Yarandel. I don't think there are new posts re recently, but at the beginning when Quarto was launched, uh, there were a lot of uh, very useful uh, tricks and things that you can learn. Um, I think that the best thing that I found is coming later, but definitely, uh, so it's not in this blog, but definitely have a go and watch it. It's like uh, full of resources. Um, the uh, awesome Quarto is a uh, um, GitHub repository that of course uh, GitHub refused to connect. So sometimes when you pre preview websites within it, it doesn't work. So I think that what we can do is to I can copy link and just paste it here. OK, yeah, as usual, uh, there are many awesome something uh, repositories on GitHub and awesome court is a collection of all the resources that you can find at the moment or at least they're like reviewed by um, Macanoli. Uh, most of the things that I knew from Quarto are coming from here or from very few other sites. I didn't see everything that it's in here, but possibly there is something that you might find useful. So have a look at this. Uh, I have included this again because I want to commit in the blogging thing and uh, this guidance uh, that is by Albert Trapp is uh, uh, something uh, that is really well written. I have tested it locally, so there is actually already a, a local blog uh, of mine without anything. So uh, don't don't tell me that I'm going to publish it. But again, Albert is going to bring you with the process of creating a blog in a very um, easy way. There are all the practical things that you need to know and uh, uh, is really well explained. Uh, six productivity acts for Quarto. This is where I'm going to copy this link. I'm going to, I want to stress on this point, which was a game changer for me. So it was kind of a revelation because one thing that you will struggle if you start using Quarto is that you have to remember all the blocks that you have to insert in the markdown that represents these new features. So for example, the call out blocks or uh, uh, the division of some content in columns or the subsets. So all these things that you may struggle at the beginning. What they suggest is to use uh, the code snippets and suggestions, which are here. Uh, no, not here, sorry. Where is that? Yeah. Yeah, so basically what you have to go is to in your studio, you have to edit snippets for um, markdown and you have insert them. And so basically what they show is that if you don't remember, for example, the syntax of columns, then you just type columns and then tab and this is going to create this boilerplate for you in order to create columns. So this is going to change uh, your relationship with Quarto at the beginning. So don't take Quarto at the beginning, please just do that spend an afternoon creating your snippets. Now, when I start using Quarto, um, uh, R for Data Science was uh, uh, under the writing of the second edition. And when I started, I don't think there was much on Quarto about it. Um, now, you are more lucky than me if you're starting using Quarto now. You missed a lot, but you will be luckier than me because now you have got two chapters at the end about Quarto, which are much better organized than the Quarto websites. So if you are starting Quarto, I suggest you to go there first and check out these resources. They are just two chapters, so if you have got knowledge of R, it won't be really like a lot of effort. And uh, you will see an introduction uh, in terms of Quarto and all the things that you can do 
with the very basics. Plus, uh, there is a discussion about the different formats, um, which are the ones that I presented to you. So basically presentations, uh, uh, documents. Uh, um, there is also a part in terms of interactivity. So if you are a shiny user, then you will be happy to know that you can include in Quarto also um, shiny chunks of code. Now, one thing that is written for data science is that uh, um, is this like this sentence that I'm quoting here, which is this edition of the book has been written in Quarto and it's clearly the tool of the future. So the sad thing about this is that basically uh, they didn't say it, but they are saying that basically at some point our markdown is going to be dismissed, uh, or at least this is my feeling. So everything started with our markdown, but in some sense they are pushing a lot in terms of everyone using Quarto, which is fair enough. Uh, but again, it's kind of sad because we, we need to say at some point uh, thought completely goodbye to our markdown. And I think that's it. So I don't know if there are any questions uh, or things in the chat. Well, at the moment we have two comments. Uh, one of them is thank you for the resources. So we will share this link. You, you could share that if you wanted to now, if you yeah. could do that. Uh, but also we will put this with the video when we put this onto YouTube. And the other so comment. I, with, if I yeah. put it in the chat, it's fine. Yeah, and I'll share it with the announcements. I'll do it with the, the okay, Q&A so people can find that in the Q&A's. Any questions, please put those in the Q&A's as I'm just chatting away. And um, the other comment is more of a comment on the the you showed like Jupyter and uh, VS Code and uh, RStudio clearly, but NeoVim plus AstroVim for the win. If that means something, <laughs> that's because you should you had that slide at the very beginning with all the different. Uh, yeah. IDEs and I didn't recognize that one at the very end which is like a bit, bit of an N I think yeah, it was yeah, related that, to that. that. Yeah, that's um, the only one. I, think I have yeah. never heard of that one so. Uh, but because Vim is like uh, um, IDE that usually uh, is used but when you say like they're, they're very nerd people so even nerdier than me. <laughs> yeah well the, the interesting thing is that we're not just NHS and we're not just R so it's lovely to have a comment about the, yeah, the ways uh, of using Vim. I know Vim, but I've never heard of NeoVim and AstroVim. It just sounds yeah. That's well, NeoVim is basically yes, is, is then like the new generation of Vim. So also at some oh, point we, right. we need to oh, that's fantastic. We need to change on this. And so, uh, yes, NeoVim. I have no idea what is AstroVim. So because in fact I never used it. So I need to get more informed about AstroVim and take note of that. Thank you. So a question has come in as a complete novice to R Markdown and Quarto. This is a great question. Which, what well, said, should I be learning R, R Markdown syntax first? And I guess that is as trainers. Do we train people in R Markdown? Because they will be recognizing other people's scripts. They'll see things in R Markdown. Or is it better to go with something that's really exciting and new like Quarto? Have you got opinions? Uh... Yeah, I got opinions. So in terms of this, uh, I would say don't bother with our markdown. So uh, less people are going to use it. And uh, if you're learning one, actually you won't find many differences. The advantage of using our markdown is more for um, um, like being capable of maintaining documents that were probably produced in the past and then you have to uh, to deal with them. In terms of learning something new, so if you never use uh, none of these tools, um, I don't see why you should start with R Markdown. If your office allows you to have a court on your computer, then go for it. The syntax actually will be very similar. There will be uh, there will be some differences, uh, but in terms of like uh, uh, pedagogical, let's say order, there is not like a preference in this. They're just uh, basically have a look look at court as something that is like. Uh, taking our markdown idea, make it universal in terms of many different aspects. So in terms of the language, as I told you at the beginning, in terms of the uh, IDE that you want to use, in terms of the engine that you want to use for doing the compilation. Uh, I can see another question by Steve. Am I correct? Hopefully I did answer to the previous question. But anyway, go for a quarter. That's uh, in, in, in the short version. So does Quarto support the child markdown documents that can be called conditionally based on logical parameters in the way? Yes, you can do that, Steve. Absolutely. You can do that. You can do parametrical. Uh, you can call uh, uh, child, mark, uh, child markdown documents uh, in logical ways. So all of these things are there. 
think about Quarto again as something that uh, didn't take anything away from Quarto, from our markdown, it just uh, made it like more universal. And in the meantime, the team spent some time in adding some features that were not uh, uh, natively in our markdown. That's basically the, 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 all the story. But there's nothing, at least in one year of use, and in my experience of using uh, uh, markdown things, uh, markdown stuff, uh, I didn't find anything that I was able to do in our markdown, and, uh, and now I'm not able anymore to do in oh, Corto. On that, I have struggled, and it could be me, uh, using SQL and Quarto because with an R markdown you can have SQL chunks but at the moment Quarto only seems to have R and Python but again that could just be my lack of uh, search skills on the internet. I, or... I have no idea because I I didn't use it uh, at the moment so this is something that I can test probably you're right when we have found something on which Quarto well, is not a problem. To be fair to Quarto, so much is happening, isn't it? So we had yeah. that little discussion on Slack and you raised it here about updating things. Yeah. It sometimes feels like Quarto's updated, but then the packages that you use within yeah. it need to be updated to you. So it's it's like a catch up at the moment, isn't it? With so much going on. Uh, are you a yeah. person who likes to be at the forefront of everything being new or do you lead your packages often to it works now? My analysis works. I'm going to no, leave no, it. No. I, I update all my packages and I tend to update all my code when it's not working or something is starting to produce warnings. So recently there was um, a deep layer, I think, update that was not allowing me to insert the extra arguments of, uh, when I was using a cross. And now I have to. Um, uh, I have to use like the tilde syntax for calling a function and then within the function uh, dot for the argument and then comma the options. So, so that has changed. So um, <laughs> I kind of freak out and say, okay, I need to update this on everything. <laughs> so Do you have I, a question? I, oh, sorry, come on. Yeah, so I need to be, I need to, I want to use all the most recent things. So I don't want to stick with the, with, with the past. So let's see what's, what's new. So I can test yeah. and I can provide feedback to the team. And we've had a comment of version for R for four. I can't even say it. Four point three. I'm so excited. Four point three version of R is out today. So Ooh, when day. lots of people have got like four point two point three or four point two point two, you're going to have to update. And by doing that, you will probably find that your packages need to be loaded again. So you'll be up to date anyway if you do update your R. There's yeah. just a bit of warning for you. But there but, is a question. There's a to carry on. Yeah, keep in mind that many people are still using 3.5, 3.6. Uh, it's not a new true. Thing. Yes, yes, we, we do. <laughs> I don't, find I don't know what's happening in HS, but sometimes I meet people using a very old version so far. Yes, so yes, yes. Uh, welcome to the uh, disparate world of the NHS yeah. where we have various versions. Yes, very troublesome. Um, good point. Trying to work through that one as well. So, um, question here which is uh, quite long because it's more of a problem solving one as well yeah. the team are trying to build a website in quarto using okay. r code uh, when they run the r code in one quarto file to create objects functions graphs for example they then find that they can't be recognized by the other quarto files we have to source and rerun the r file again this seems to be a problem in r markdown not to be a problem in r markdown yes so how would you approach because I don't think you've done much you said about websites and blogs because you were you were that's your yeah. to do list which yeah, yeah. that's great but how would you approach did, a problem yeah the things that I did was uh, the, depending so if you want to save a graph uh, okay let's see what, what we can do of course if you source that part of code then this is sold so all your code will have a source call at the beginning and then this is sorted definitely if you're creating a quarto uh, website, uh, what happens? So let me go back on here. Uh, where is it? So it's this one. So, for example, when you have like your website, uh, what I think you're referring is that the, the things that are happening in the home page, say, are not the same things that are happening in this page, different. So the starting point will be different. There will be two different compilations. So, for example, if I have two load packages, this has to be done separately. Is this what you mean? Is this what I mean? I've published the question, so okay. I'm not sure if people can reply to that one as well. It was from um, sort of an anonymous person. 
So we'll see if there are any okay. more responses to that. And so I guess that the question is if I create something here that is stored in a variable, say for example, the content of the variable C, okay, then this content won't be um, accessed, uh, won't be able, I won't be able to access in this page, for example. I think this is the, the, the question, isn't it? The thing and, I would also, oh, sorry. Sorry, if this is the case, then I would say that actually this uh, is something uh, that is not a bad thing uh, in the sense that uh, um, it kind of makes sense. Uh, what's happening and what's living in that page is an environment, uh, say, that has to be on its own. Uh, therefore, uh, there, are, there should be some solution that you have to put in place that uh, needs to be structured in a way that are not like creating conflicts in your website. Uh, the first thing that I would do is to, so if you're creating uh, objects, uh, functions and graphs, um, in terms of functions, uh, the thing to do would be to store them into a file that you can sort at the beginning or even better in a package. That would be the, 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 the solution. In terms of graphs, uh, uh, that depends. So if the graph that you want to include uh, is an image that is produced after a long computation, which requires time, I don't see the point of repeating that computation all the time in every page that way you need it. And so there are things that you can do here. For example, you can source uh, the thing, no, because that would repeat uh, every time the computation. So I would just save the plot somewhere and create some code that is going to recall uh, uh, the thing. So at the beginning, for example, of say your own page, you create uh, some chunk of code that is kind of hidden. This is up to you how to organize it depending on the project. So I don't think there is an universal solution. And then you can save the image somewhere and call it uh, by just importing quarto images. I don't know if you need uh, anything else. What, are, what other uh, cases can happen? So create an object and find that everything is going to be the other quarto files. So I think it, there's no point of having yeah. uh, uh, like share the content uh, within different variables apart from these two. The functions can be sorts and the graphs are just images. So, but if you've got uh, any other things, uh, uh, let me know. Yes, maybe I'm missing something. Yeah. No, no, I think because uh, I think you're on the published view that we've got now, but on the new, that was what they, you meant. So that was what they meant. You've, you've answered the question. I okay. think if people have specific questions as well and they're part of the NHSR Slack group, please do put them on there because we can all benefit from the continued conversation about Quarto. Sure. That'd be really good. Um, and you also mentioned the R for data science chapters that have been added to the second edition. We yeah. have decided as the NHSR book club, which is just a few of us. I have that seen this. You, you, pr you printed that you're going to run through second uh, edition. Yeah. Actually, this can be an excuse for me to join today. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, let's and we can leap straight to the Quarto. So that's on at uh, three o'clock. Three till four, that's BST, British summertime at the moment that we're on, because we do have some international people who come and Very join nice. us. And that's absolutely, everybody's very welcome. And we are just going to go through some of the exercises. We are going to tackle them properly, having built a quarto um, book, I think it was, to put these into. Yeah, there is a repository, the yeah. I, I, I look for, well, maybe that can be like a nice thing. I, w I really wanted to reread re it because I didn't read like fully the second edition. I did read like the first edition back in time. Yeah. And so that can be an excuse to explore some, uh, definitely I'm missing many options in Tidyverse. Uh, there are lots um, of new things in the new edition. It looks like a very interesting yeah. thing about code styles and um, mm -hmm. all sorts of new things are in there so it's there's so much that's changed and that book is being updated as we speak I think I'm not I'm sure it's sure, out to yeah. publish in paper form just yet I'm not sure about that um have we got any other questions it's it's very quiet I'm hoping that people have found a few things in here that they can work with oh the other thing just to promote as well on NHSR github that we have um we were given a quarto NHS theme document that is open for people to use or contribute to from Craig Shenton at NHS England. They've done quite a few things using Quarto and websites and NHS England. So definitely have a look at that. He kindly passed it to us so that we could sort of have a wide reach for the NHSR theme, NHS theme, sorry, not NHSR specifically, but the NHS theme. So there's a lot of interesting things and exciting things happening with Quarto. And hoping to see your blog soon. <laughs> have you got a name for your blog? Have you thought about a suitable name? 
Was it just your name? I wanted to use like a bug from someone who didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say with blogs, I, I got excited a few years ago and I did a distill, a Hugo Apero, Apero yeah. and, and now I need a Quarto one. <laughs> so it's like, I need oh. the hat trick. I need all of but them. Again, Testing it is super easy. So you start from the command line, you create a new project, there's a blog, and everything is already there. So you don't have to do much. And then you can import um, all your R Markdown files as well uh, within your blog. So uh, the porting will be fine. One thing get, that I've seen can be difficult is if you are like, um, uh, uh, you want to like to spend time uh, depending on your thesis in terms of theming. Uh, so you have to play around a lot with CSS there. Uh, and uh, possibly all the teams that you were using with the uh, distill or you got or may or not work. Uh, there is a lot of work in the background in terms of theming like presentations, uh, HTMLs. Uh, so you will find, especially on the awesome Quarto repository on GitHub, uh, you will find a lot of stuff um, in terms of customized themes and uh, interactive elements. Uh, but again, this is up to you. So I tend to be as minimal as possible. So it's mm -hmm. not my thing. Uh, uh, but again, uh, no judgment here. Anyone can do whatever they want to with their I blog. I struggle with content. It's, it's filling it up, isn't it? And on that, we do do blogs on NHSR website. So if you just want to do a blog and contribute, but not necessarily build a website just yet, you can submit words or code or a mixture of both in Quarto, R Markdown, Word, PowerPoint, probably a bit tricky to publish. Mm, but we no. put that through the NHSR no, community I, I website. Have got, I have got like uh, a revenge feeling in terms of Microsoft as so. yeah. well. I just, <laughs> it, did, yeah. it didn't allow me to present the last time, isn't it? Though? No, that's very true. And I'm so pleased that you came back and uh, no further questions so far. And we're just a few minutes off the two o'clock mark. So it's probably a good time to say thank you so much for coming along and Thanks giving for the this invitation. It was a great pleasure. Well, hopefully um, somebody is going to use Quarto starting from uh, today or tomorrow. We have the NHSR conference coming up in October. The abstract call will be out soon for the talks and workshops. We're hoping to see you again, maybe during yeah, that time. Not? That would maybe be something wonderful. more technical that I will, I will yes. love to present. We would love that and it's great to have you here. So thank you everybody and thank um, you. have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.